Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Rachel Jones speaking to you. I am an associate professor of biology and environmental science here at the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma and the current chair of the symposium committee. Before introducing this evening's speaker, I would like to point out a couple of features available to the audience throughout the talk. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll notice a bar of icons. I would like to draw your attention uh, first to the Q&A icon. Feel free to leave any questions that come up as you watch Judith's talk. You are also able to upvote another member's question. I would also like to draw your attention to the chat icon to the right. Please leave any comments you have for the speaker or other audience members here. We only request that comments and questions be kept respectful. With that, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 USAO Emerson Weir Liberal Arts Symposium. This year, we are pleased to have Judah Pollock as our speaker. Judah is a lifelong student of the liberal arts. He graduated with a BA in political science from Kenyon College with a minor in integrated studies. Judah is a professional speaker and business consultant on the art of leadership and the science of breakthrough thinking. Additionally, he has co-authored two books on these topics. He is a former faculty member of Stanford's Star X and works regularly with US Army Other clients on his roster include Airbnb, Sonos, Best Buy, and Lucasfilm, where he often talks about why Marvel comics succeed, DC movies do not, and why so many people are angry about that Star Wars movie. I first found Judah because of his phenomenal TEDx talk in defense of the liberal arts, but it's not his only TEDx talk, and a quick Google search will, of videos for Judah will yield over 7,000 results. It's likely that many of these are duplicates, but it does demonstrate the prolific work he does and the reach of his message. Speaking of Google, Judah has been an invited speaker at Google, as well as Stanford and UC Berkeley. Judah develops his practice by continuing to study. I had the privilege of witnessing a wonderfully insightful lecture he gave to a class of our freshmen just yesterday, diving into the depths of finding meaning in life beyond the economical. Using skills developed as a liberal arts student, he expands his own knowledge and has taken deep dives into Jungian theory, Tibetan Buddhism, the Western esoteric tradition, the Enneagram, and shamanism. The question he is engaging right now is, how do we come to know and express our humanity in the age of scientific hegemon? And what value is there in that humanity? With that, I now invite our speaker, Judah Pollack, to the screen. All righty. Am I on? I always yeah. have to check. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. Um, this is such a disembodied universe we now um, live in. It's such an odd way of doing things, but Thank you so much for the introduction. It was very kind. I had no idea 7,000 results showed up. That's, that's insane. I don't know where that's coming from, but thank you for telling me. Um, good evening, everyone. I, uh, I'll keep my talk on the shorter side to try to leave more time for questions. I found people are usually very curious about Silicon Valley, which is why I, I, I put it in there. And um, don't be fooled by the cleanliness of my, my background. I'm looking at a, a very messy office room um, on the other side of this, uh, but I try and keep this as clean as I can. So in, in my view, the, the liberal arts, it's really about asking the question, you know, how do we live a good life? What does it mean to live a good life? What is a good life? And we live in an age of such intense capitalism and, and that system provides an answer to that question, which is be productive and accumulate stuff. And I feel like people accept that answer. We all get caught up in it at some point or other in our lives, um, but it, it doesn't really hold water for any of us. And, and to ask the question in a deeper way really requires the kind of education that the liberal arts gives. And I have found in my over 15 years being in Silicon Valley that so many times there are 
there are questions I will pose or references I will make that I find to be very simple that can be quite illuminating for people who have gotten caught in the churn of Silicon Valley. And another interesting thing about Silicon Valley is it's actually not a disruptive place. And I know that sounds kind of crazy considering it views itself, it, it, its bread and butter is being disruptive. And, and it is in one sense, right? They disrupt the hotel industry, they disrupt the taxi industry, they disrupt the telephone industry, the entertainment industry, the music industry, newspapers, novels. It's like, where does it end? But there's an underlying pattern that maintains itself all the time and that Silicon Valley is invested in maintaining. So while the way in which we do these things is disrupted, really what we're talking about is a transition of capital. And this is no different than what happened in the industrial revolution when we had a transition of capital from the agricultural landowning to the production um, factory owning. And now we have a transition from the production factory owning to the digital platform. But the way we're actually doing these things stays the same. And the underlying pattern, the energetic pattern of trade, of dominance, of control, that is all still firmly in place, even though people within Silicon Valley will fight you to the death that that's not actually how they're operating. In order to make this point, um, and so you don't have to keep staring at me and my kind of blank wall and funny lighting, I'm going to share my screen and show you one of my favorite quotes of late from Silicon Valley, because it just, it just cracks me up. Um, there we go. So young man who sold his company recently, uh, it's a uh, self-driving technology. And the founder and CEO credits the foundation of his success to dropping out from Stanford University. He said, I always knew academia wasn't going to be the right route for this because if you really want to make a huge impact into the world, being stuck in a given lab is not the right way to do it. You have to be able to commercialize it. You have to make it economically viable. He goes on to say, that's why I'm just so happy to see all this value creation and having an opportunity to really apply everything that we do into the real world. His parents have always been super supportive and encouraged him to do his technological black magic in the garage. Now, by the way, he's about 26. And so I wanna play a little game I call, you said it. And I take parts, different parts of your quote and I combine them to try to get a little more at the subtext. And I feel like this, this particular game with this particular person really um, shines a light on the underlying proposition of Silicon Valley. Success is dropping out from university because if you want to create value in the real world, you have to commercialize your black magic. And I, I don't say that lightly, actually. Um, this is very much um, a, a very powerful mindset in Silicon Valley and, and it's a problem um, because there isn't a lot of thought given to what is being created. Now I could stand here and be like, oh my God, Silicon Valley, it used to be known as Orchard Valley and it was so beautiful and take the whole romantic point of view and say, now look at it, it's just office parks which is true, but a lot of good has come out of it. So I wanna, I wanna come at it from a different angle. And of course you can't talk about Silicon Valley if you don't talk about Prometheus. And here's the famous statue from Rockefeller Center, Prometheus, very often associated in America with New York City, right? And Prometheus of course was a Titan and New York City is where Titans of finance and Titans of industry come from. But we have to talk about it in regards to Silicon Valley and Prometheus steals fire from Olympus and he, he actually keeps it in um, a fennel shaft. And it's just funny because fennel grows like wild out here in Northern California, it's everywhere. I've always just thought it's interesting to see these fennel, wild fennel plants popping up around all these Silicon Valley headquarters. Anyway, Prometheus steals fire, but the Greek word for it is techne, the root of our technology to fashion, to make. And I always thought that was rather a fascinating connection as well. And as we all know, one of the things that happened to humanity when they were given techne was Pandora's box. And I don't think I'm going out on a limb here if I say that over the past four years, we've really seen the element of Pandora's box um, come forward <laughs> in the form of technology and what it's done for us and what we've been dealing with and what has happened. And there, there's a reason for this. And it's that 
so many of the founders don't really understand, have a deeper understanding of what they're doing. They don't have a deeper understanding of the role they're playing in the larger context of society. So yeah, this is a quote I wanna show you. It's, it's my all time favorite quote from a tech Titan. He's actually a fairly decent guy, co-founder of Twitter, but this is from an article in the New York Times from 2017 and I just love this. I thought once everybody could speak freely and exchange information and ideas, the world is automatically going to be a better place. I was wrong about that. And the, the I was wrong about that really hits home for me because it's just this, this sudden realization of this poor young man who is a Titan. And I like the fact that, you know, Prometheus is a Titan and they talk about Titans of technology. I don't think people are aware they're doing this, but um, that this poor young man just, he had this almost willful idealism about what technology was going to do or a willful ignorance about humanity. Um, it, it, it's as though they, the people in Silicon Valley are unaware that there's been a dialogue going on for 4,000 years about these very issues, about how do we live well together? And the belief is that technology is just going to, just going to make it all better. And we are now coming to the place where we're realizing it hasn't made it better, it hasn't made it necessarily worse. It's just morphed. It's completely changed the way life is difficult. It's completely changed the way we deal with complexity. And this is where I feel like the liberal arts mindset is absolutely essential and is being needed to come forward now to ask the question of what do we do about this? And just last night, I was having um, a wonderful conversation with a friend of mine who actually works at Twitter and she's involved in a deep dive into QAnon and how QAnon is working on the platform. And it was amazing to start talking about it from the point of view of the liberal arts education. And I'll get into this later, but the idea that QAnon is actually a Gnostic movement. And if you don't understand it from the point of view of a Gnostic movement, it's hard to understand how it works. But to give you an idea of how little a lot of these founders understand, I remember having a conversation once with somebody, an executive very high up at Airbnb. And he'd had a very hard day because as he put it, um, there was a Palestinian person who had listed an Airbnb apartment, but it was on disputed land. And um, it wasn't right because it was on Israeli land in the occupied territories. And I kind of looked at him and I said, do, do you have that correct? Are you sure you have that right? He's like, absolutely. And I said, okay. Um, if I say the year 1948 to you, what does that mean? And he just stared at me blank. Now, this is somebody who's in charge of dealing with this issue in Israel and the occupied territories. And I said, and if I say 1967, six day war, blank. And this is not to, to judge this person to make fun of this person, but this is just to say that it's a, it can be frightening how little information, how little knowledge some of the people who are operating and making very important decisions in the technological world have about history, have about the larger context all of this is operating in. And so I remember reading how Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Seneca all had young men that they were working with and hoping young princes that they were hoping to turn into philosopher kings, excellent leaders. And of course, Alcibiades ended up fighting for all three sides in the Peloponnesian War. Um, Plato ended up, <laughs> Plato was imprisoned or enslaved, depending on who you ask, by falling on the wrong side of Dionysus of Syracuse. Aristotle, of course, um, did not exactly create the wise philosopher king in Alexander and, well, Nero, Seneca, enough said. And so there's a, there was a real question for me of, well, what am I going to do? Um, with being out here in Silicon Valley with our version of these young princes who, if they were brought the liberal arts education, if they were made to have more of a philosopher king point of view, could do such good. And yet it seems so difficult, especially if we look at what's happened over the past four years. And of course, there's a, there's a historical or there's an ancient tradition of this being a need. Here with the Sphinx, we see a human head, reason, logic, control of the emotions, controlling an animal body, controlling the animal instincts. And of course, when Jesus rides in to Jerusalem on top, on the back of an ass on Palm Sunday, this is expressing the same idea, a human being who has come to control these baser animal instincts and channel these energies into something more good. And we see this even today in the movie Avatar, where you're literally, the, the characters connect their braid 
into the part of the, the flying animal and that thus their brains are able to meld and they're able to control, to work with the flying animals. It's the same idea of the sphinx of the human head and the animal body. And if we, if we track this story, then when we had watched Game of Thrones and Daenerys clearly was not within her emotional safety zone a lot of the time and was getting angry and being mad, then the end when she destroys King's Landing would not have been quite so surprising. Although I will admit I was surprised as well. I only figured this out after the fact, but that's a story for another time. The Minotaur, of course, is the classic example of this reversal of the animal head, the instincts, the lack of control of the emotions, the lack of orientation to reason on the human body. And, and we see this in a more American fashion. I love this New Yorker cover where the lion is eating a salad, being so tamed by our society as his prey walks around safe and sound. And there's this wonderful ad from the Harper's Weekly um, where you see the same thing, the, the very well put together gentleman, but a lion's head, this idea of the, the predatory nature that's lurking just beneath or actually not lurking just beneath and coming forward. And, and we know that this is the case with so many of our leaders. And the question is, what do we do to try and dampen that, to try and bring the conversation to another level that we know we can bring it to? The story of St. George is another version of this where St. George kills the dragon. And Robert A. Johnson has a wonderful little take on this story um, in a book of his where he talks about um, the dragon, St. George and the horse are all lying mortally wounded and there's a magic lemon tree and the, lemon, the little bit of lemon juice drips onto the lips of St. George and revives him. And then St. George drips it onto, into the mouth of his horse and revives the horse. And then Robert Johnson says, nobody woke the dragon. And the idea here is that we're not supposed to kill the dragon. We're supposed to work with it, to integrate it, to channel it, to hold it. And we see the same thing in ancient Egypt where Horus fights a hippo, which in Egypt is the most dangerous animal and comes back having tamed it, not having killed it, but having controlled the energy. And one of the problems in Silicon Valley is there is a refusal to admit that this battle is going on. That's why the young gentleman in the very beginning with the quote says, I have to commercialize my black magic. To him, the black magic is not dangerous. He's just throwing a phrase out there. He's unaware that because it's unconscious in him, it really is black magic. It really is dangerous. And that these tools have come to be used to attack our very democracy. They've been used to attack our, our weakest. They've been used to literally upend what we think to be true or not true. And that is a form of black magic. And if we don't admit that this struggle is going on inside of us, if our titans of technology don't acknowledge that this struggle is going on inside of them, then what chance do we have to even begin to use these new tools to ask the question, what is a good life? What is a meaningful life? What is virtue? And this brings me back to Prometheus and Zeus. And and in another version of the story in the Protagoras, when Zeus finds out that human beings have been given fire, have been given techna, he's like, but they're like my, they're my entertainment. Um, they keep things interesting around here. They're gonna destroy themselves if they have access to this. And so he gives human beings two things in the story. He gives them justice and he gives them reverence. And Silicon Valley, which has been utilizing the heck out of techne has so little reverence. They feel that reverence will get in the way of innovation, that reverence will get in the way of progress, that reverence will get in the way of being productive. In fact, to have reverence is to not be disruptive. To have reverence is to not be willing to upend the status quo. To have reverence is to hold yourself back. And that's why we're seeing this unbridled rush into the future without reverence for the past, without reverence for everyone that's gonna be affected, right? The, the Facebooks move fast and break things. It's not just things that get broken in all of this. And there isn't really a sense of that being the case. Apollo in many ways is the patron of Silicon Valley, Apollo and Hermes. Um, Cause Hermes is the God of the crossroads, the God of, of theft, um, the God of traitors, um, the God of the traveler, the God of moving between 
um, world moving between lines. Um, and so it's funny because I know W.H. Auden wrote a poem um, bemoaning the rise of the Apollonians in academia and the fall of the, the liberal arts and the hermetic followers. But I, and, and there is an argument to be made about that, but I wanna, I wanna take a deeper look at Apollo because Apollo is of course the God of light. He's the God of reason, he's the God of music. Um, and all of that points to his being the patron of Silicon Valley, the, this God of reason. Um, but he's also the God of prophecy, the God of the divine, right? It was his oracle at Delphi, his Pythia who spoke from the point of view of the gods. And when Apollo was first given his chariot of two swans, couldn't find two swan picture, but when he was given, first given his chariot of two swans, the swans immediately took him north to Hyperborea, the mythical land of knowledge where he was initiated into the mysteries, which is a very interesting idea for a, a, a God of reason and logic. And that takes us to Protagoras. Protagoras is known as the father of logic, um, the first um, Western written logical argument is attributed to him. But he was also a priest of Apollo and they were known as lords of the lair. And what they would do, and they were healers, and what they would do is they would go and lie down in a cave and wait for up to three days for the God to bring them a dream, to bring them a vision, to bring them insight. And with that, they could go and heal. So while Apollo is this God of reason and light and music, he is also a God of vision, of prophecy, of connection to divinity, connection to something more than who we are, more than what we are. And of course, Apollo was very arrogant and he was an archer and he was kind of brutal and deadly. And at one point when he'd gone just too far and the other gods demanded Zeus do something about his kid, Zeus turned him into a shepherd for a year to teach him humility. Um, and I think all, all those who feel like gods and titans need this humility lesson. But the, one of the problems in Silicon Valley is Again, there isn't this understanding of the dual nature. So in the same way that there's a, there's a refusal to admit the shadow, there's a refusal to admit the inner dragon and the fight going on there, there's this love of Apollo and the reason and the logic without accepting the orientation to the divine, to the mysteries, to the things that we can't know, to the things that are bigger than we are. And we can't talk about Silicon Valley if we don't talk about venture capital. Here's what you have to understand about venture capital. I want you to imagine a wall. We don't have to imagine it, I just showed it to you. But I want you to imagine a wall. And then I want you to imagine 300 people, and they're almost always men because venture capitalists are, um, well, I'll refrain from using phrases. Let's just say if you're a white guy, it's a lot easier to get money from a venture capitalist. But I want you to imagine 300 of them running headfirst at the wall. That is what every year is like with new startups and venture capital funding them. And what venture capital does is it funds all of them. It just funds them because it, it admits it doesn't know. And it funds all of them. And the bet is that some of them are going to make it through the wall. Now, majority end up like this. They just bang into the wall. They're done. That is the sign of a failed startup. They're just not going to make it. But some of them are going to bust through the wall. Maybe like 15 of them are going to bust through the wall maybe 20. And once they make it through the wall and they get their product into the market and now they're racing, they're going to face crazy obstacles. And these obstacles are going to be all about product market fit. They're going to be about scale. They're going to be, it, it goes on and on and on. What the venture capitalists are doing is they are finding people who are going to be fundamentally relentless at attacking these obstacles, at breaking through these bizarre obstacles so that they can dominate the market. This is the end goal of venture capital. Monopolize the market your product has entered. Destroy everyone else in the space. Get me my 100X return. The venture capitalists are funding these young men mostly so that they can become Alexander the Great. They're funding these people. And what they do is they, they're looking for something very specific. And this is what they're looking for. They're looking for people who are wounded and have compensated for that wound by being utterly relentless towards a goal. 
in the hopes that in achieving the goal, they will heal themselves. And one of the most tragic things you'll see in Silicon Valley is a, is a startup founder or co-founders who have succeeded. They've done it, they've been relentless and they have won the brass ring. And they turn around and they realize that it didn't heal them. And if this level of success, this unheard of insane level of, of success wasn't what healed them, then, then, then what will? And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking when you encounter it. It's, 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 yeah, it's really brutal when you see it. And so this brings me to this concept of gnosis. Gnosis is truly knowing something through your own direct experience. And there is a way in which Silicon Valley, for all of its disruption, doesn't disrupt the paradigm narrative of how the world works, of what is good, of what is virtue, of how to live a happy life. Right? It's this, it's become Alexander. It's conquer everything that you see. It's be productive, progress, and accumulate. And nobody is looking for that more direct connection. So what is it the liberal arts can bring to Silicon Valley as Silicon Valley starts to create the products that are gonna define the future. Well, in some ways I would say there's nothing. There's actually nothing for us to bring because people aren't necessarily gonna listen. Um, and that's one of the difficult things about Silicon Valley is it's very hard to get people to listen to anything other than a product idea, other than a way in which they're gonna make a, a lot of money. But for the liberal arts, there's a sense of all of us joining a 4,000 year old conversation and being the keepers of that flame. It's a conversation where there aren't necessarily answers, but there are a tremendous number of questions and more to the point, there's a deep, there's a deep curiosity as to what this means as to why we're doing this as to is this the best way is this the most purposeful way is this what i want is this what everybody wants is this the the hope for everyone and right now is still not the time and I think it's not the time because I think that um, I think Silicon Valley is an engine. And it's not really that different from other central engines that we've seen drive economies. And there always comes a point when the engine does become somewhat self-reflective. There comes a point when the engine starts to almost become aware and start to ask itself, um, what am I doing? What is the purpose? What is the point? And that's when liberal arts students are so needed. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of artificial intelligence companies out here, obviously doing all kinds of things with artificial intelligence. And so sometimes you get into these conversations where you're asking yourself or you're asking other people, um, what happens if a computer or a network becomes self-aware? What does it mean? Um, is it dangerous? Is it scary? Are we just assuming that it'll be dangerous and scary and it's actually not? And what's interesting is when, you, when you're talking to the engineers, they're, getting, they're very fact-based. They're very oriented to the question of, um, well, what would make it self-aware? How do you define self-aware, right? Kind of a Turing test in that regard. Um, well, could we just shut it down? But what if it is dangerous? And of course there's the Terminator element of Skynet and it will just destroy all of us. And so we need to put in fail safes. 
And what they don't realize is they're immediately taking a stand of it's going to be adversarial. They're immediately taking a stand of it's going to be a fight for resources. It's going to be us versus them. And as a liberal arts student, I am able to point that out to them. I'm able to say, hey, you know, your framing matters. And not only does your framing matter from the point of view of how you come to this, but it matters in the other direction as well, that if artificial intelligence were to become self-aware, if we frame it properly, it doesn't have to become a war. It doesn't have to become a battle over resources. And I remember the engineers looking at me just thinking I was some sort of, you know, neo hippie and being ridiculous. And that's, I, I just pointed it out and I said, hey, um, well, when AI becomes conscious, is that like a birth? And there was, all, there was discussion and they kind of came around, and, okay, yeah, it's kind of a birth. I was like, okay, so how, who here has kids? How did you feel when you had your child? What was your relationship to the child? What was it? And kind of took them through. And I was like, so what if you viewed the eventual self-awareness of artificial intelligence as a birth? How would you approach the new consciousness if you viewed it as a birth? Now, this is not exactly genius on my part. I want to be really clear about that. But being a liberal arts student who got to be in that room, I had the ability to kind of play with the frames, ask the questions, check at the assumptions that everybody was bringing to the table. And this is a similar, this, this brings me back to um, QAnon. So QAnon, which is only possible because of social media, is a Gnostic movement. And I say that because Gnosticism is based on the idea that the world is created by a demiurge, not by God, and we're all being fooled, right? And we need to try and break free of the illusion of the world and understand what's really going on. And that is what QAnon is saying. You're being fooled, not by the demiurge, but you're being fooled by the deep state. And you should go and find out for yourself and do the research, which is their big thing, do the research and get the knowledge and you'll see for yourself. And this is where the idea of it being a Gnostic story comes in as well, because Gnosis is your own direct experience of something. And that's what QAnon tells you to go do. Go have a direct experience, go do the research and then you'll know for yourself. And this is turning into a huge problem as well because there's something called LARPing, which is known as live action role-playing, but online what people do is they, they, they come online and they convince you that there's somebody they're not. They convince you there's somebody central to the movement, even though they're not. And then once they've convinced you of that, they try and maneuver things around. And LARPers have jumped into the QAnon world and try to manipulate what's going on there for people. But in order to understand the QAnon movement, you have to understand the Gnostic movement. You have to understand the power of the Gnostic story for anybody who feels disenfranchised, for anybody who feels disempowered, for anybody who feels the world, they, it, it, the world doesn't make sense. Right? For many of us on the outside looking at QAnon, like that's craziness, we don't understand it. But for people deep in the QAnon world, it is sense making that they're involved in. And to have the, the empathy and compassion to try to see it from their point of view, another you know, mainstay of the liberal arts education. And so it's not, again, just like not killing the dragon. We're never gonna put this genie back in the bottle of the way QAnon is manipulating social media. We're never going to put away the allure of a Gnostic story, that there's a truth that we can't see but if you can, but you can go find it yourself, but we can engage it. We can try and work with it. We can try and deal with it, which I think one of the things we're seeing is the Pandora's box of technology of the explosion of technology onto the, into the digital realm. We're starting to see where the battlefields are. We're starting to see where the problem sets are, which is going to open up a whole new category of questions as to how we engage it, how we deal with it. And the titans of technology are not actually equipped to do that. Again, they are in their roles because they are relentless, because they are wounded in just such a way that they are relentless. And so the creation of QAnon is not a reason to stop being relentless. They can't stop themselves. They're just constantly pushing forward. So it becomes the province of those of us 
who are the torchbearers of the 4,000 year conversation about these very questions. How do we live as a community? How do we find meaning as an individual? How do we support one another while not controlling one another? Right, these, these foundational questions that shift as the technology shifts become where we as the liberal arts holders are necessary in the Silicon Valley experience. And so the last point I'll make in all of this is about the idea of gnosis. And when people in Silicon Valley hold so tightly to the Apollonian model of reason, of structure, of data, of analytics. And you see this, at my, at people analytics is my, one of my favorite Silicon Valley terms um, coming out of human resources, coming out of Google, where basically you don't have to actually get into the, the nuances of human beings. You can just look at the data of what they do and how they do and what's going on and you can manage them that way. Um, which goes along with another very funny system that comes out of also Google, which is called radical candor, which is a communication philosophy or theory that says, you know, you can have ruinous empathy, which is true. You can be too empathetic and therefore you're conflict avoidant. Um, and you can have like basically hard truth, which is truth without any compassion. Um, I always forget what the fourth one is, but then there's radical candor. And the idea here is that we should speak to each other in complete honesty, but with a loving heart. And it's, it's, it's a lovely theory, but it's been, it's clearly thought up by an engineer, possibly a friend of the person who I quoted in the very beginning, because who of us can come with a pure heart and speak really hard truths? And so when you, when you see radical candor used in a, um, in a corporate setting, it really, what I describe it as is it becomes an excuse to throw hammers at one another. Hey, I'm just, just radical candor. You know, but meanwhile, we've thrown something really hard at somebody. This is what happens when Apollo's logic and reason is applied to the human realm without any recourse to the deeper parts of ourselves, to the more mysterious parts of ourselves. And so Parmenides, who I spoke of earlier, the father of Western logic, who also was this priest of Apollo, this Lord of the Lair, um, wrote a poem. There's not a lot of Parmenides writings, but there's this logic argument and then there's this poem. And the poem talks about him getting in a chariot, being driven by these two women and descending basically, like it's a magical flying chariot and descending down into the lower realms of the world where he is going to go meet um, this goddess in front of these doors. And there's the sound of this whistling and a very often um, they use this kind of whistling pipe in ancient Greece to get into a more ecstatic meditative state, an altered state. And so this idea of Parmenides taking this journey, this, this perhaps psychonaut style journey to this goddess down in the depths to be handed wisdom. So it's very interesting that again, a priest of Apollo gives us reason and logic, and then also gives us the story of achieving knowledge by gnosis by an altered state, by, by, dig, by sitting in his own humanity and seeing what comes forward out of his own mind. And Apollo having these two different ways of being, this, this, yes, this logic and reason, but also this prophecy, this divinity, this being initiated into the mysteries. And until the valley, until people in the valley, until the venture capitalists, until the titans, until the relentless boys, um, are willing to own this other part, are willing to accept that there is a level of darkness that we all hold and that we must grapple with if we want to live a truly virtuous life, that our societies hold that. Um, when Evan Williams said, I really thought the world would be better when everybody could just speak openly to one another, um, that, that refusal to acknowledge that there is this darker part that we have to wrestle with and understand, which is such a part of the liberal arts education. Um, that is really what needs to be brought to Silicon Valley and the sort of personal discipline that comes with that search. Um, you know, very often, one of the things I love about the ancient philosophers is they, were, they weren't fighting with the most complicated topics. Um, the, getting to the bottom of them was complicated, but you know, what they were actually saying in, in terms of how do we live is fairly straightforward. And I feel like that's a question that 
it's up to all of us to ask now that the world has been shifted by technology so much that the playing field is different. And so how do we live a good life given all the technology um, is an excellent question. Of course, the underlying energetic pattern of how we relate to one another, how we exchange with one another is the same. Um, so to Silicon Valley's insistence that they have disrupted the universe as we know it, um, we should not be fooled by that. There is still a deep need for those of us who have been involved in the long dialogue to come forward and try and help Silicon Valley understand how that long dialogue affects the way that their technology has come forward. Um, I will stop there and just open it up, um, but thank you as always. Wonderful to get to talk about this. So strange to talk about it into the void like this. Thank you, Judah, so much. That was, again, just as fascinating as yesterday. And so um, one thing to say, any of the attendees, any of the audience members, please feel free to visit our Q&A section to drop in a question. Um, but I'm gonna start us off with a couple questions of my own um, while we give others a chance to, to formulate theirs. Okay. So my first question is, social media has been slow to enforcing their own policies regarding hate speech, regarding the spreading of false information until the last couple of weeks, conveniently. And so my question to you is, even though there has been a lot of pressure on these social media platforms to enforce their own policies to a greater degree regarding these things, um, they didn't act on it yeah. until recently. Do you see this as a development of what you called reverence or is this, do you think more of um, a reaction to a changing political sphere? Unfortunately, the latter. Um, again, that, that, that th these founders are not the way they are by accident, right? No different than a professional basketball player doesn't just happen to be um, seven feet tall. Like someone is going and looking for this. And so people are going and looking for these founders who are hell bent on growth, right? That Alexander the Great image and starting to enforce these rules might impact growth. And so they were gonna wait as long as they possibly could. And they were gonna use um, the fact that the, one of the biggest um, rule breakers on the platform was the president to say, well, we can't really deal with this yet. And so, right, after, once there's an insurrection, <laughs> um, all of a sudden there's political cover. But again, it's like, what you're seeing is you're seeing they don't really know how to do it and there's still a desire to not cut things off right these are this is not these are not philosopher kings these are these are child princes these are merchant princes right these are the medicis um and, and it's important to remember that for because they spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year um marketing to us that they mean well and if you have to spend that much money marketing that message there might be an issue Thank you. Okay, so we have a question from the audience. It is, will the change in business slash society due to the pandemic deflate the Silicon Valley bubble? I'll begin by saying, I don't know if anybody actually knows. So caveat, like don't trust me on this. I'm just gonna give you my thoughts, um, maybe for a moment, uh, but, in many ways, the pandemic accelerated the trends that were already happening, which was the adoption of these technologies. It forced a lot of older people like me to get really more comfortable doing all of this stuff. I mean, how many of us would know how to use Zoom right now so well if it weren't for this pandemic, um, as well as a million other things we've had to get used to using? So technology is what, what Silicon Valley is doing, it's going to keep doing. Um, there's a lot of runway left. There's a lot of room left. There might be a bit, the bubble might burst. There might be a couple of quiet years, a couple of fallow years, but it will come roaring back. Um, cause it, this is where things are going and it's, I, space is going to start to become very viable and cheaper. 
um, not tomorrow, not next year, but 20 years from now, 30 years from now. If you look at the plane the Wright brothers first took off in, and then you look at the DC-3 that came out 30 years later, and then you go 30 years after that and look at the Boeing 707, it doesn't take long for these enormous leaps to take place. So I would not be surprised if our grandchildren go to space. Um, don't be surprised if you know we're all in driverless cars in 25 years, which seems like a long time, but that's a huge shift. Don't be surprised if we're all in electric cars within 10 or 15. These things are accelerating, they're moving fast and faster than you can imagine actually. There is an enormous amount of brain power that's being concentrated in these industries. Could you speak to the value of a liberal arts education in a world that requires pivots and changes, especially in a pandemic or post-pandemic world? Um, yeah, I, I feel like one of the things that liberal arts education does, at least did for me, is it, it gives you a very open-ended relationship with what is so, what is real. Um, there's a sense that things do change and change is the norm and just understand the change, understand the pattern. Um, and it, it gives you strength, it gives you ability. And so living in a world of tremendous uncertainty can be a lot easier for someone who has studied the liberal arts because the liberal arts is all about, well, what about this? Well, what about that? Well, what about this? Well, what about that? And it gives you more of a facility to change with that more of a facility to grow with that and, and shift how you approach the reality as it moves. Because the idea of being locked into a single reality very often is something that we look at. And then we look at, well, what is that single reality in the West versus what is that single reality in the East versus what was it like in um, ancient India or what was it like in Japan? And, and we start to see that, oh my God, it's multiple and then, Yes, the, the people will call it relativism, but it doesn't have to be. It can be more just a, a, a form of intellectual compassion. Um, and from that point of view, we can be aware that like, yeah, the world's gonna keep shifting and we will move with it. And I find this is very helpful, especially for liberal arts students when it comes to jobs, um, especially in today's day and age where you, you may not be doing the same thing you were doing five years, 10 years, lots of professional shifting that's going on. And um, liberal arts students seem to have a toolkit to pick up new skills and see the connections and move into other areas. We have another audience question. It says, not really a question, but I am fascinated by the idea of joining a conversation that is 4,000 years old. What a connection. Would you care to talk a little bit more about this? Um, yeah. So I, I've been shifting my practice actually away from tech, funnily enough. Um, and doing more with social impact companies. Uh, I think they used to be called nonprofits. <laughs> and, um, and some of them, a lot of them are based in India and I have a few clients there. And just before the pandemic began, I was doing a, a three week project uh, with a group and they, they start schools in rural villages so that young girls would get into school and will be married off at age nine. It's really wonderful. And bringing just leadership things to them and awareness, self-awareness. And, and for a lot of the people further down the line, they didn't get to do it very often. And what was fascinating was getting into conversations with them where in India, um, religion is much more potent and much more present. And so I was getting a fast education in Brahma and Vishnu and Shiva and Kali and Rama. And we just kept going. And at one point they took me to a, uh, a Shiva temple and ended up in the, in the rush, in the mass with people and got to experience what it's like to have kind of a spiritual experience through the sheer numbers of people, right? Usually it's like, oh, you go to the forest and you're by yourself and then you have this experience. And here all of a sudden it was like, no, this was about the group. This was about the collective creating the energy to have that experience. And so to, to suddenly get into conversations and realize that things that I had learned that the ancient Greeks had thought about or that the Egyptians had thought about, all of a sudden I'm learning that, oh yeah, we have that in Hinduism as well. And the questions are always the same, like, how do I not suffer? How do I actually find joy? How do I live with my neighbor who I actually can't stand, um, but I'm stuck with them? Um, what do I do about the fact that the government is corrupt, right? These are literally questions that are ancient because the minute we started gathering together as people, we started having dysfunction. And the liberal arts in many ways is, is, is an analysis of that dysfunction in the hopes that we can find a way to be more functional, 
to use more psychological language, but it's, 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 a, it's an engagement in this dialogue and, and, and this dialogue has just been going and going and going. Um, it's amazing when you look at some of the ancient sources and what they talk about, even as they talk about coming to greater consciousness and some of the imagery that you see. Um, it, it's quite phenomenal and it's a wonderful feeling to, to, to know that you're participating in this party that has just been going on and it's moved from place to place and you can actually track it. And there's a fun thing that uh, sometimes I give a talk where you can actually, um, you track golden ages throughout history and wherever there's a golden age, you'll see this kind of cosmopolitan liberal arts orientation um, anywhere in the world where you see there's a golden age of some kind of flowering of the arts, a flowering of technology and innovation of wealth at the, you always see that there's this, this open-mindedness, this bringing together of different people and this asking of these questions. Um, and that dialogue is sort of, for me, the bread and butter and the heart and soul of the education I feel lucky enough to have gotten and then to continue. One more audience question I see. Do you see nonprofits as disruptors? It's a good question. Um, yes, they can be. Um, so when I said that the Silicon Valley is not disruptive, um, I just want to be clear, like obvious, obviously they are disruptive from a technological point of view. Um, they're not disruptive from a larger um, societal point of view, the way that we actually engage with one another, um, as can be seen by, you know, Twitter did not bring out the best in us, <laughs> right? Twitter has amplified the worst in us. So from that point of view, that's what I'm saying, they're not disruptive. Um, and so nonprofits can be disruptive, but the problem is they're limited by scale. Um, they need so much money and well, I mean, everybody does to operate at scale. And so the nonprofit world is very much at the, the whim of the wealthy philanthropist or the government agency. And both the government agency and the wealthy philanthropist have vested interests in the status quo. So who's gonna fund a truly disruptive nonprofit when it might actually gore their own ox? This is, the, this is the paradox at the heart of the system. So when you're, when you're doing nonprofit work, part of what you're dealing with is a recognition of the limits of what you're able to accomplish because you're, you're gonna scale just so much. And then at some point, somebody's gonna be like, well, hang on a second. We don't, we don't wanna change the world that much, right? I wanna be able to sleep at night. I wanna look good when I give a talk. I wanna I want be able to say good things when I'm at a, when I'm at a uh, cocktail party. I don't want it to actually like come into my backyard. I don't want to give up my advantages. That's, that's, right. That's, that's the road of humility. That's the road of ego death. That's the road of the mendicant monk and the people who fund nonprofits are not walking down that road. And it's just, it's, it's just a, it's a paradox. It's a contradiction in terms that we, we kind of live with. And I remember being, once being told a story, I asked them, I asked the guy, he, he had taken a group of donors to a village in India to see what they were doing, but then they had to, they had to leave the village in order to eat their lunches because their box lunches would have seemed so extravagant to the people in the village. And I said, is that hard for you? And he's like, yeah, it is, but it's not near the hardest thing. And I said, oh, okay, well, what's the hardest thing? Because the hardest thing is when I'm sitting here in Mumbai and you know, working my tail off and I'm on a video call with a bunch of billionaires on some Caribbean island who are sitting there with their martinis who I need to convince to give me money and they're questioning me as to how I know what I'm doing is gonna work. And that is kind of the, the really painful, difficult, emotional um, paradox that people who work in the nonprofit world live with every day because you can't tell those people to go to hell. You can't tell them to like get a clue. You have to play with them for a higher purpose. And so very often people who work in nonprofits, they either burn out or they actually have their own kind of Gnostic experience. They have their own experience of Gnosis where they, they kind of connect to their sense of a larger purpose in the world. And that's why I've discovered I really like working with them because they go down that road with me. Um, tech executives very rarely will go there. And, but when you can go down that road, it's, it's very rewarding and interesting. 
All right. Um, so I think we have time for one more question, and we've got one for from the audience. Um, and reading it, um, any students that have had our World Thought One course, this is going to automatically make you think of this course. It very much sounds just like um, what we do in that class. So the question is, in your opinion, would present and future students at USAO be better served if there were great emphasis upon the leaders, writers, philosophers, et cetera, of the ancient world? I feel like I'm getting played here. There's a trick question and I have to be very careful how I answer. <laughs> um, well, I will say this, that I don't know your curriculum. So I don't actually have a reference point for how much you do or don't study these uh, people. But it, it, I'm a big believer in origins. And so it's very helpful to know where things begin. So, and, and while like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle are great, um, you know, they were all sent to Egypt. That's where they went to get their wisdom. Um, that's where Pythagoras went to get his wisdom. So what I would say is yes, I think it's, it's always a wonderful thing to, to get information from these foundational thinkers to understand what the frame is of the entire setup that we're operating within. Um, one, don't assume that they started it. Um, they, none of these things come out of nowhere. They've been going around for a while. Um, so be open to that possibility of how ancient some of this knowledge really is. Um, two, I would say when you study the ancients or anybody really, um, study like the big classic things and everything, but also be open to some of the, the stuff that maybe gets cut out. Um, here's one thing I'll tell you around that. Uh, I was taught that at, at things like the symposium, um, they would drink mixed wine and it was mixed with water. And that's why you would see pictures on bowls of young boys putting their fingers down the throats of the men to help them throw up so they could drink more wine. And I was always like, for supposedly very intelligent men, this sounds ridiculous. Like if the goal is to get drunk, why are you watering down your wine and vomiting? That's crazy. There's a great book by a guy named DCA Hillman. Um, called The Chemical Muse. And in it, he documents all the um, sub alter uh, mind altering substances in the ancient world and their use. And the Greeks um, loved opium. Um, the Mycenaeans on Crete loved it. Uh, they loved it so much they had slang for it. They called it the juice. They would actually call it the juice and that's what they were mixing their wine with. And so when you read the symposium, uh, the Platonic dialogue on love, you need to realize that like, that's what's going on. They're drinking wine and opium and they're getting kind of altered and they're discussing what they think about love. And to realize that this has been a part of the human experience the whole time. And that these people, again, from that, that mix, the Apollonian mix, like, yes, they were philosophers. Yes, they were coming up with mathematics. Yes, they were looking at logic and they were also mystics. And they were engaging in a whole other way of knowing, a whole other experience of being in the world. And we cut that out of Western thought. We act like it's just not there. And we just focus on the logic, the reason, the rational, because that's what we like here. And so keeping your mind open to, the, to, to not only what these ancient thinkers and leaders were doing and saying and the lessons that can be learned from them, but also to the parts that are getting left out because the parts that are getting left out tell you a lot about what we value today in society. And they also are pieces that are missing that give you a much deeper appreciation for just how complex the world really is. And that, if there's anything I think the liberal arts is so fantastic at, it's helping you deal with complexity. And dealing with complexity is the A number one skill I think anyone needs in the world today. Like if there's any, if there was anything I would say that you need to develop, it's that. How do you deal with complexity? Because the world is not getting less complex. That was a wonderful answer. So we are out of time. I want to thank all attendees for coming tonight and especially thank Judah for coming for another wonderful talk. I feel so lucky to have been part of yesterday and this evening. So if anybody would like to reach out to Judah, um, please get in contact with me, Dr. Rachel Jones, here at the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma. 
and I will do my best to, to keep you all in touch. Thank you all for coming. Sign off and log off your computers uh, safely this evening, right? I don't get to send you home onto the streets, but <laughs> have a, a safe, lovely rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone.